So now it's my great pleasure to introduce the first panel. It's called Reality Check 2020, Rebuilding Resilient Food Systems. Nina will be moderating this session. Nina, please join us on the virtual stage. Nina is the executive director for the Berkeley Food Institute, and she was the founding food and agriculture editor for Hypen Magazine. Her writings on our changing food system have been published widely. Read up more on her. She's amazing. Nina, I'll hand it over to you. I'm just really happy to be here, and thank you so much for having me. And um, and I hope, Kat, this is really such a great honor and uh, first time participating in this event. Um, I guess I'll just go ahead and introduce myself and what we do at the Berkeley Food Institute. I'm the executive director of our uh, public research uh, institute at UC Berkeley. Uh, we are focused on transformation of food systems. We've been around since around 2013. Uh, right now, we're focused on a few main areas, and they directly relate to uh, climate change and regenerative agriculture. So, And we work a lot with entrepreneurs, so I'm really excited to uh, meet you all and, and learn about what you all are doing. Uh, our main areas at, at Berkeley Food Institute are looking at jobs in the food system, urban and rural agroecology, and good food access. I'll get more into it in my discussion with Kat about you know, what that means and, and how we dig into those topics. But one of the things that we're especially interested in, in, in is building the human pipeline um, to support this work. So um, as we train students, faculty, all sorts of talent that comes through our doors, um, how are these people going to go on to help us build uh, regenerative and sustainable food systems? And we've been so amazed by the companies and nonprofits and um, other types of enterprises that our, our graduates have founded. So um, we're, you know, really, really excited by the potential of that. Um, I've been asked to really sort of set the stage for today. Um, I, I wish I could see you all, but I hope that you all join me in the Q&A after this sort of plenary session and we can um, talk more intimately. But I'm, I'm going to just imagine all 200 of you out there. And thanks for taking your morning. I hope you have a beverage and something warm to keep you going this morning. Um, before we launch into today, I mean, Let's set the stage. We just finished um, Climate Week in California, um, and the news is coming fast and furious. And for some people, some people are trying to um, consume more news. Some people can't handle all the news that's coming at us. But one thing you know cannot be ignored is that climate change is an existential threat. It's face. It's affecting our economies, our health, our physical health. Um, it's affecting uh, our schools. It's affecting everything that we um, create, invent, and try to share with the world. Um, it's something that we obviously cannot ignore and uh, that we're all trying to incorporate into our planning. Layer on top of this, the pandemic, of course, that we've experienced. Now, um, those of us that uh, those of us that have been working in sustainability and um, sustainable food systems, um, of course, the pandemic is, an, is in total crisis and has caused untold suffering, but we've also noticed that it's revealed ways that we can perhaps consume less. Um, it's, it's revealed ways that we can even spend less, drive less, travel less, and as uncomfortable as that might have been to consider a few months ago, here we are, we're living through it and um, we're, you know, we're able to still function in some ways as a society consuming less. How can we take the learnings of this pandemic into the future and have it help chart a course uh, to reversing climate change and to reversing the negative impacts of climate change, which are so uh, disproportionately affecting our communities? So I, I like to sort of start with the good news and the bad news. You know, I think that that's really the good news is that Again, many of us might have had a panic attack at consuming less and look at us, we're doing it. Um, so the air above Los Angeles has been clean some days. Um, we, we are, you know, really reducing uh, our emissions and we're able to improvise. We're seeing an excitement around local and regional food systems as, of course, certain supply chains um, fell apart and certain supply chains are really suffering right now because they were not set up for human health and the pandemic is um, has just broken or some of those already fragile systems. 
So let's take some inspiration from what we've um, been forced to confront and, and take that as a kernel in, you know, into the future. Unfortunately, the pandemic has also revealed, you know, the life-threatening reality of our inequalities. And I'm glad that this conference or gathering is, is willing to tackle those because they are going to affect business investment and our, our environment for years to come. Um, the social, it, racial, economic, gender, even geographic inequalities are, um, have been only intensified uh, by this pandemic. And they are something that we also cannot ignore with regards to climate change. How can we get through this mess and get through the mess in a more equal and just way? Are there ways that we can invest in and bolster our public institutions that will support all of us um, as we are, are going to be in this shared crisis of climate change? Um, this, these, are, these are things that we're gonna be talking about today and, and charting a path forward post pandemic um, but still facing climate change, coming out of this as a society that is recognizing the challenge of climate change, but feels inspired to um, inspired to reverse it and inspired to uh, make sure that all of all members of our society um, can uh, share equally in in the ways that we're going to create a new society. Um, I think that I'm going to be joined soon by. Um, Jenna to ask some questions. It's so great to hear you and thank you for setting up that framing. I think after all of our conversations yesterday, everything you just shared is just more important and just so, so integral for us to talk about today. So I wanted to dig in a little bit more on the work that you're doing. You had talked about urban, like three main areas that you're working on. You had talked about urban and rural agroecology. Mm -hmm in the food system as well as good food access. Yes. I was wondering if you might want to dig into those a little bit more with us. Um, what does this mean and how does this impact this food funded community? What uh -huh. can you sure. on this and, and help you? Sure. Thanks for asking. Well, maybe I'll start with urban and rural ecology because we are really focusing on, you know, climate solutions today. And um, we've been really amazed by the years of research in the research community on agroecology, which is, I guess, simply stated, it is sustainable agriculture. It is agriculture being done with ecology in mind. So that means that agriculture being done in a way that is, um, you know, some people use the term biomimicry or creating, um, uh, creating human-made uh, systems that do mimic um, the miracle and the best parts of nature. So um, that's a very simplified way and perhaps the scientists would clobber me over the head for saying it that way. Um, but I, I, I try to make it you know, clear to understand. And um, what we've really been amazed by in studying agroecology in the urban context, that means urban agriculture. And in this pandemic and in this crisis time, people have risen to the challenge, thrown themselves into farming and gardening, sometimes at a great scale, and producing an amazing amount of food for themselves and their neighbors. Um, this has been so impressive. And I think, you know, it's, it's not just a meme, people getting into um, gardening, but people are really doing it and, and creating a lot of um, food for hungry neighbors. Um, even beyond that, it is about rebuilding our regional food infrastructure. And many of you are involved in that in terms of, you know, uh, local slaughter, niche meat, local grains. I think it's amazing what's happening. It's we're realizing that we need to rebuild a strong regional food economy. And um, that is that we, we needed it before we heard about climate change and we need it that much more now. So that's an area that we're uh, both supporting and constantly researching and, and trying to push further. Uh, rural agroecology is about production agriculture and how all production agriculture can shift to a more sustainable model. So um, that's the part I think we'll mainly talk about today because um, Kat, I know, is also a rancher and she works, she has her own ranch. And so we're talking about how these learnings from agriculture can, you know, be shared more broadly. Um, yeah. Um, and I guess I'll just also touch real quickly on the jobs part, because I think that's also going to come up today, is that, um, how do I say, you know, some parts of our food system were uncomfortably bad before the pandemic, you know, they were 
I, I don't know how to say it. They were people saw it as unfortunate. It's too bad that our slaughterhouses in the United States are built the way they are, or it's too bad that restaurant workers don't have sick time off. But now we realize it is it is causing people's lives. It is it is ending lives, and that urgency has only been turned up. And I think that this is it, instead of retreating from that, let's fling ourselves into it. And let's use this opportunity to fix it. You know, let's make animal production be more sustainable. Let's create restaurants and retail food operations that um, that provide people a really great job. You know, and that's already happening all around the country. You know, we have the one fair wage movement, the no tipping movement, and they're attracting customers and people are feeling what a higher quality product that's producing. So. We at Berkeley Food Institute, we're working a mile a minute, <laughs> even though we're, you know, far, far away or dealing with childcare, but we are really trying to understand how this moment can help us see something new that's possible. Um, it, it, I, I think that it may eliminate um, some of our race to the bottom food systems, the cheapest, I don't want to say crappy kind of um, uh, model of food production, I, I think is going, is already becoming passe and, and this has only turned up that, that um, urgency is let us only create food businesses and food enterprises that um, can really stand firmly and create um, stronger economies and stronger communities rather than going in the other direction. That's what we're excited to talk about. Absolutely. And I wonder, one of the tools that we had talked about and something that you had actually studied, I think you had mentioned that it's, it was part of your thesis, was looking at the power of our schools. Yeah. You were just talking about how do we start building or getting to higher quality foods. Yeah. And imagining something better that's possible. Can we start with our youth? Could we sure. start with that? And I think Kat's also working on this too. Yeah. What's yeah, that? What's our know, power there? Definitely. Everyone has remembered. Did you eat school lunch as a kid? I know I did. Did you, did you enjoy oh, it? Yeah. Didn't enjoy it, was, it? it was scary. Like I, I brought it most of the days because I, yeah. I can't handle it. And I, I hope that no other children have to go through what I did. <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, I've written about the fact that, yeah, I was grateful to have a, a good food beginning at home because I, I certainly ate a bunch of junk at my school lunch at school. And, and we need to change that. Um, we want this to be a unifying and a wonderful experience for children. Um, and uh, yeah, so school lunch is, um, is a huge program run by the U.S. government, run by our tax dollars. It supports a huge amount of um, children eating, eating breakfast, lunch, and actually in some cases dinner around our country. Um, both children who um, can afford food and want to eat together at school and children that um, can't afford food and really need this as, as life-saving um, you know, nutrition. So I studied it and we're working on it at UC Berkeley because we think that if these are our tax dollars, shouldn't they be going to the best quality food? Shouldn't they be going to um, support the type of farmers and ranchers who are doing practices that are going to help lead us out of climate change? So we see a lot of possibilities because it is a public program and ostensibly as citizens, we should have some say in you know, it's execution. That's, I think, part, a really important part of democracy is food democracy, that people can um, speak up and say, you know, this is, this is this program, which was actually inspired right here from the Bay Area, from the Black Panthers and their free breakfast programs really led to um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, deciding to set up a national program and free, in some case, free or reduced price um, breakfast and lunch. And now it has really grown. In some places, it's a great food. In some places, it's awful. And what Kat Taylor is doing and what I'm so inspired by is trying to get universal school lunch for everyone in California, which means free lunch. It's done, done this way in so many other countries. Why quibble over $2 here, $3.25 there? Just have it be all free for anyone so there's no stigma and everyone can understand that this is part of the educational day. We don't ask children to go in at 11 a.m. and pay 50 cents for that day's portion of the textbook. I mean, how ridiculous is that? Like instead, you should receive all the education at once and, and we know that food is a big part of that. Um, I do see um, a question that came in, which am I allowed to answer now or how does that go? Absolutely, sure. yeah. Talking yeah. about biomimicry and kind of heading into that. Yeah, um, actually, yes. He said someone someone said 
that regenerative agriculture is really built on indigenous wisdom. I completely agree. I didn't, I wasn't sure if we we're going to have time to get into all of that really important history and origins, but yes, I mean, um, it's long overdue that um, farming in the United States is looking um, towards the origins and towards the first um, food cultivators um, here in the United States who are and the indigenous people who are still here and, and are asking to be listened to um, in terms of um, you know, food practices. So yeah, absolutely agree. There's sort of a, an ecosystem of words and terms that swirl around and um, you know, I think it's, it's good that we use them interchangeably, but I, I do think that um, indigenous food and it's not always called agriculture um, because that's um, a certain type of food cultivation, but you know, indigenous food systems are something we all should learn about and I'm constantly learning about, and there's a lot of resources to do that. So thanks for bringing that up. And I, I wonder too, as, as we're talking about integrating this work into places like our, our, our food system with, with schools, are there other things that our, our communities, so if we have entrepreneurs, investors, what are ways that we can increase our purchasing power through, I know so much of what you work on is policy. So you're training the next generation of students, of getting them involved in this. What are ways that we, we can also do that? I, I keep looking, I mean, tonight's a big night. We've, we've got a vice presidential campaign. I know. What is your ask from us to support this in terms mm -hmm. of building resilient systems? It's so holistic. It's a system based problem. What, what can we do to help do this? And I know Kat's got, got a bunch of things that she's working on from growing people to um, practicing on actual branches and bringing us out. We've talked about needing research. Um, what are some of those key levers you can pull and really help you with this work? Yeah, oh, thank you so much for asking. Um, yeah, I'm sort of putting it on, you know, ways forward, where to invest. I sort of made a list and I was I was thinking and and thanks for bringing up the a VP debate tonight. I'm looking forward to watching and I hope that everyone can double check their registration and you can vote early in your county office and just get it done and, you know, spend the rest of the time being aware and, you know, helping other states if you're outside of, if you're in California um, to participate in our democratic process. I think that's going to affect our food economy a lot. So it's really not unconnected with, you know, the private sector. There's, as you all know, there's billions of dollars invested by the government in either good or not so good food systems. And we can control where that goes. Um, so how can we, you know, how can we help it at this time? I'm glad you brought up policy, of course, participating in policy, staying active, um, staying aware, you know, showing up at local meetings. If you're, if you're a business owner and you, you know, contact your local elected and say, or an investor and say, you know, I'm really concerned about this problem. How can we work together to fix it? They do listen. They will listen to you. They will extra listen to you because they want to keep jobs in their area and in their district. So um, I always encourage folks I work with to make friends with those legislators and invite them to your farm, invite them to your business, let them know what's happening in this world because um, they need to stay up on it in order to keep their job that we have hired them for. So I think that's, that's really important. And, you know, another, I think, important way, and so while we're on the topic of jobs, is thinking about how you are building good jobs in your business. And, you know, like, are you trying to, are you running it on unpaid internships, which can be, um, you know, uh, a bit, you know, problematic for people who can't afford to take those types of internships? You know, is there a way that um, we can think through, you know, really good jobs for people at all stages of their career. Are you able to build jobs for um, people who are on the retiring retirement end of their career? Is there a way to build jobs for people that are limited English speaking? You know, coming out of this crisis, um, we, I think, have to show that this good food economy is the way forward. I mean, organic foods are exploding through the roof, even with the pandemic. How can we bring more people into that, you know, wonderful excitement? And um, that's that's a win-win for everybody, you know. Um, so I'm happy to talk more to investors or entrepreneurs about how to do that and the role, you know, universities play in, in helping to provide a, um, a, a funnel. I think that, um, you know, uh, 
what do you say, Fortune 500 companies have long had a recruitment strategy in certain universities um, and in close connections. And, and we need to think about how do we um, create similar um, networks of connections and cross pollination in our sustainable food companies and good food businesses. Um, so those are, those are two things I can think of right off the bat. And I was thinking about that too, like what are ways that we can bring more people along on this ride with us? I think mm -hmm. I was, um, we were supposed to work on a session together at Expo West this year. Mm -hmm. I was looking at nutrition and especially in dairy and different yeah. ways that we can get people at different life stages invested in this through food. Like, yeah. have you seen any good examples of ways to bring people into this rebuilding and resilient food system through food? I mean, we have such a powerful lever to use here mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. industry from investors to brands. Mm -hmm. You know, I think visiting farms and getting out in nature is really important. Now, I worked at the USDA under President Obama, and part of my work on building regional food systems was, um, you know, some of it was some office work. And I worked in a, an, an office with a bunch of really dedicated public servants who are almost never allowed outside of their cubicles. And I said, let's get out on the farm, you know, and we had everyone from, you know, the secretaries, the folks, you know, sorting the mail and the policy advisors. We all jumped on a bus and went out to an organic farm that was about, you know, an hour outside of DC and had an amazing time. And I think even just having those learning experiences together to, that can go through your place of worship, through your book club, through your neighbors, um, any other way that, uh, or that can get out and really understand this viscerally, then people can understand how they can jump in however they can. I mean, I'll never forget the time when I was in Japan and in a regenerative farm years ago and the farmer reached over and he picked up a big, um, you know, a clod of, of dirt and just squeezed it like a sponge and the water just came pouring out of his hand on a not rainy day. I was like, I can't believe it. This is, I didn't know such a thing exists. So this just set off a light bulb in my head that I think um, maybe it's harder to read about in a book, but you um, really can feel it face to face. So I think if people just get those type of um, ex visceral experiences, then they will be creative in terms of how they want to and see a way to jump in. What are you thinking about the role of regenerative agriculture and ranching in this system. I've been seeing so much with the launch of the Kiss the Ground film that's finally out. I've been seeing clips for like the last three years, anxiously waiting, and now it's hit Netflix. Um, do you think this is like an amazing solution, like something we can help get behind? And really, I know our panel later today with Nick McCoy and Esther and Elizabeth, they're going to talk about investing in this and especially looking at soil, like that, that image you just gave us of that soil with water coming in. It's really, really healthy, like ecosystem there. Um, what do you think about that? And, and hopefully Kat will be able to share a little bit more about that too. Yeah, for sure. And I'm really excited to introduce her. So um, yeah, I mean, what I described about squeezing the dirt like a sponge is what scientists are calling co-benefits, which means that we get co-benefits of water um, from really re great regenerative agriculture. Yay, here's Kat. And she's, uh, for those of you that no don't know Kat, uh, she is um, a powerhouse. She's the co-founder of Beneficial State Bank, as well as Tomcat Ranch and many other enterprises. Um, she has really taught me that you can be an, entre be an entrepreneur and start concepts as well. There's concepts and examples that you can uh, lead the way in as an entrepreneur. I think she really believes in teaching by doing, and she has an urgency to reverse the course of our energy economy. And we share a belief that the food system can play an outsized role in that. So um, she has many different enterprises. I didn't know which one she wanted to mainly focus on, but please take it away, Kat. Thank you. Thanks for the time today. And it's been a great conversation so far. Um, so I'll try to build on it. I always try to go to first principles when starting, which for me right now include, not, uh, not inclu exclusively, but that we're at a moment to center the movement for Black Lives. Absolutely. Uh, when we achieve Black liberation, self-determination, mm -hmm. and joy, we will get just about everything else right as well. Mm -hmm. um, and Tom Steyer always tells me, if you can't solve a problem, make it bigger. And I love, Nina, that you created the widest aperture possible to think about the promise of regenerative agriculture and changing our food system for good. And then lastly, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste, as you also mentioned. Leonard Cohen said, look for the cracks, that's where the light gets in. Mm. So um, at Tomcat Ranch Educational Foundation, which is where I would focus today, 
um, albeit that we work in good money through Beneficial State Bank and two venture funds, Radical Impact Partners and Bright Path Capital Partners. Um, good governance where we're working on uh, philanthropy, philanthropy reform, uh, all sorts of policy work at the state. Um, but we are, have a very significant commitment to good food. And that is um, largely emanating from Tomcat Ranch Educational Foundation, where we work in four verticals. First, uh, a producer strategy, which is to create a community of practice uh, around regenerative agriculture. We are not a livelihood ranch, so we have the luxury of getting to experiment, de-risk, and broadcast regenerative practice, which is deeply founded in indigenous uh, hunter-gatherer and agricultural societies, uh, which we acknowledge um, by acknowledging the indigenous peoples who first occupied Tomcat Ranch as well. Um, but as you mentioned, the co-benefits of regenerative ranching are many, uh, not just the resequestration of carbon, the quality and quantity, quantity of water retained, biodiversity above and below the ground, animal welfare, human health, food security, economic resiliency, uh, but also a chance to shift our food supply chain uh, permanently in favor of racial and gender justice, environmental restoration, and economic resiliency. So can we do we, that? Can yes, we do that? We can, and we <laughs> are. We are definitely doing that right now. Um, I want to just touch on a few of the things that, that's happening at the ranch pertinent to that. Please. Um, so we, uh, in partnership with Sally Calhoun at, and Esther Park at Picinus Ranch and the Meridian Group are introducing two new farm bill insurance products, right. which will help with the transition to regenerative practice for many producers. So rather than guarantee 85% of crop yield based on applying the national fertilizer recommends, which we deeply think we need to move away from, how about we uh, guarantee yields based on integrated pest management, the Marin, the uh, excuse me, carbon farming practices of NRCS, et cetera. Let's change the incentives in the food system. Mm -hmm. We're also um, deeply ensconced in fire management. Mm -hmm. This is fire season. This is a doozy of fire season in California, uh, driven partly by the suppression of fire in a fire ecology and largely by climate change, changing our weather incidents, including lightning storms. Um, so regenerative practice creates lands much more resilient to fire uh, and able to bounce back faster, um, also avoiding catastrophic fire. And then this is the most exciting to me. We need to start transferring assets and power and control back to the BIPOC communities from whom it was stolen in the first place. So Tomcat Ranch, we're in the exploration stage of seeding lands, literally giving lands to farm worker driven cooperatives so that uh, we improve land access and land control and secure more constituencies uh, in practicing regenerative ag. Mm -hmm. So sorry to take a long time on just one vertical, but that's the producer strategy. Yeah. We have a demand strategy as well, which you mentioned, which is California Food for California Kids mm -hmm. um, that has now recruited uh, 90 school districts in California who represent a third of the billion meals served every year to recenter lunch as part of the academic curriculum. The cafeteria is the largest schoolroom on classroom on campus um, and uh, the teaching elements of the lunch which by virtue of buying food in California that is minimally processed, ma uh, minimally preserved, maximally organic, we are not only shifting the food supply chain, but also teaching our children from where their food comes and the many repercussions of how it's produced. Um, that's our big buyer strategy actually is working first and foremost with school districts, but you can imagine if municipalities, uh, hospitals, prisons, universities, the mushpas also did this, we would make a rapid transformation in our food supply chain. Mm -hmm. And then there is that supply chain strategy. So this year we launched the Growing the Table initiative, which is a complementary program to the Farm to Family Partnership that pays the pick and pack out expense of harvest that would otherwise go to waste and donates it to the food banks of California. 
the uh, Farm to Family Partnership identified three pain points that we are addressing with Growing the Table, a triple entendre, uh, in order to permanently shift the food supply chain in favor of racial and gender justice, environmental regeneration, and economic resiliency. Mm -hmm. And those three pain points are there are 70,000 ranches and farms in California, and very few of the smaller producers who are organic or regenerative have access sufficiently to demand channels. So in Growing the Table, we're running 20 pilots throughout California where we specifically target BIPOC, LGBTQ++, female organic regenerative farms, and we buy their harvest. We don't just pay their pick and pack out expense and get that harvest into emergency feeding programs. But importantly, we don't want to create dependency on emergency time feeding programs. We want to increase the demand channels available to those farms. So uh, in addition to contributing those foods to the food banks, we are also proliferating the other demand channels so that now we include school districts, uh, the restaurants reactivated by World Central Kitchen, and community-based organizations like Corazon, Puente, Aberg in Fresno. So the, that will introduce our, those is essential farms and ranches to us to so permanent sources of demand. It also attends to the third pain point, which is um, access to food. So a farm worker in Fresno may not be able to get to a food bank between nine and four, Monday to Friday, and an undocumented farm worker may not feel comfortable going to a food bank. So uh, on the other hand, if we work with the United Farm Workers or Eberg, there, we can create um, uh, appropriate sources of supply uh, during food aid times uh, and afterwards. Uh, so that's the Growing the Table initiative. Mm -hmm. The last thing we work on is policy and research. Mm -hmm. So as you mentioned, our, uh, we have in the past worked on policy to make sure that the school districts of California are supported in purchasing California-grown food. Um, we have been involved in policy efforts to increase uh, food funding during the COVID emergency. Um, and we are excitedly uh, uh, launching a campaign to uh, secure a universal free school lunch at first and eventually all food on California school district campuses. Mm -hmm. uh, as you mentioned, it's unconscionable that we bifurcate our school populations into free and reduced and non. Uh, every child should have access to uh, cooked from scratch organic, regenerative, as much as possible food um, that's healthy and that they can uh, learn over as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then the research agenda you're helping with more than anybody I know, but we have had a research agenda uh, biased in favor of the industrial ag system. And it's time that we got back to something uh, way more regenerative in practice and had the academic research to support it. Yeah, we're, we're fighting for that. We're fighting to change our academic system so that it can reflect their, the problems we have right now and that we see in, in the coming years. You know, let me ask you, how has, it been, how has it been broaching these conversations, particularly these difficult questions of race, power, land ownership um, that gets to the core of um, a lot of deep issues? I mean, how, how, has it, how has it been in your enterprises having these kind of discussions? Well, when we travel with the company we typically keep, uh, we're very aligned and they go smoothly. Mm. However, you do not transform a $46 billion industry lightly. That's the um, second largest sector of the California economy. Uh, the Imperial Valley alone is $6 billion and provides half of the winter fruits and vegetables eaten by Americans. Mm -hmm. So there are deep financial incumbents in the system mm -hmm. Uh, you, we know from other advocates that you don't that poking that bear creates uh, can create a massive amount of opposition and resistance, and we're just going to have to be smart about how we cultivate coalitions uh, and just transition for those who are willing to come with us on the shift to the food system for good. I think culti cultivating coalitions is so much, it's at the core of it, you know? I mean, when I was at USDA, I worked also in the Office of Civil Rights and we we're dealing with settling the claims of black farmers who had been discriminated against for years by the USDA. And there was such a sense of the folks working on civil rights and the folks working on organic 
we're not talking to each other. And sometimes there was a mutual suspicion. And I always thought if we could just get together because there was, there was a, a different type of marginalization both groups had experienced, whether your farming practices make you marginal or you know the color of your skin or your ancestry or other parts of your identity marginalize you. Like what could, it, what could it amazingly happen if those coalitions were built? I think we're just seeing the possibility of that, but we're not yeah. there yet. And in growing the table, we found because we have consulted with over a hundred experts, um, ranging from racial equity to regenerative agriculture to philanthropy, on the pilots that we're running in California, and we were explicitly cautioned not to require formal certification of organic. Hmm. Um, anybody on the pathway is, deserves to be supported, but also black farmers um, don't tend to certify because they're legitimately and understandably suspicious of government agencies, given the treatment that they've had by the USDA and the farm credit system that did literally steal millions of acres from them over time. Um, yep. And also uh, a lot of farmers can't uh, achieve the certification because they experience pesticide drift from the large industrial producers uh, in and you know, around them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So important, important things to think about as we do build those uh, partnerships and coalitions, they have to be also historically aware, you know, we're not just starting today. Um, and, and, and as we know that history, we can build stronger and more durable coalitions, I, I feel so. Looking forward Wait. to working with you after, uh, after this. Definitely. So. Fantastic. Definitely. Well, Likewise. thank you thank so you. much to both of you. Please stay on here with me. Okay. Um, um, I mean, first of all, virtual applause to Nina and to Kat.